You see, we have a radio guest in the studio with us. And of course, we shall be talking a lot in the market today about the manufacturing sector, streamlining the manufacturing sector. What are the highs, the lows, and what needs actually to be streamlined? Kicking out also some of the kinks that we know has not been very, very smooth when it comes to the manufacturing sector. This morning, I'll be holding court with Professor Francis Muller from the University of Nairobi, Department of Biochemistry. He'll be telling us more about, you know, micro... Uh, not really microbiology, but marine sector when it comes to the economy. Also, we do have with us Mr. Fernandez Barraza, who is the managing director of Ketraco and the vice chairman also of ISPEC as well. We have Beverly Spencer Obatayimbo, who is the MD of British America Tobacco Kenya. Also, we do have with us uh, Flora Mutai, she's the chairperson of Kenya. Association of Manufacturer Igri, Igri, I should say, waiting for Harry Muchangi Njagi. He is, of course, the regional marketing head of Mabati Rolling, Rolling Mills. And he'll be here momentarily. He's running a bit late. But, of course, this is how we shall be uh, discussing the manufacturing sector, looking at the energy uh, sector. How is it adversely affecting also uh, the manufacturing sector? And we sit in a privileged position. We are the fifth largest economy in Sub-Saharan Africa. We have a well-educated labor force. Our financial services and information technology capabilities are amongst the most developed in the region. And our infrastructure is the most advanced among peers as well. Uh, as we know, we have access to vast agricultural resources and home to some of the most innovative entrepreneurs globally. Despite these advantages, our manufacturing sector has remained stagnant at 11% of GDP over the past 10 years. As a result, the number of formal jobs in manufacturing has grown at just 7% per year. Over the past four years, our exports have stagnated at 15% of GDP, while inputs have grown to 40% of the GDP, creating a trade imbalance, weakening the Kenyan shilling and increasing inflationary pressure. These gaps can only be closed by revitalizing our industrial sector and turning Kenya into an industrial hub. I've created first time, as I told you this morning, with our guests who are already here and they'll be telling us more about the manufacturing sector. But before we drill deeper, let's see what is headlining the dailies today, the good, the bad and the ugly. We look at the Daily Nation. Kalonzo, he says, we want to meet with Uhuru Ruto. That is what we have on the front page of the Daily Nation today. Wiper leader angling for peace of the Raila Uhuru Pai says the country can only have all-inclusive dialogue if all political parties in the NASA coalition have a seat on talks table. This story is tucked away on page four of the Daily Nation today. Also, Moy getting better will be home soon. That is what we have on page nine of the Daily Nation this morning. After the rain, the damage. Key road washed away by floods. We give you all the gritty details much, much later in the course of the program. Also, Hawking, man who breathed life into science. He's dead and his story is on page three of the Daily Nation today. Let's see what we have on the front page of The Standard, which is up next. And this is your headline today. Scandal of mass teachers failure. That is what we have. Headlining the front page of The Standard is all about education, concern over poor grades and teacher training colleges whose graduates are posted to primary schools. This is on page six of the standard today. Also, MPs push state to drop new fuel tax. This is all about cost of living. Senate committee tells Treasury the VAT on petroleum products will trigger an increment in prices of other commodities, but government wants the 34 billion shillings. Of course, uh, we want to see what we we will have in that particular sector and how it will adversely affect the Monenshi as well. The star is up next. United for Wands. Wipers Kalonzo warns NASA core principles to meet Uhuru over inclusion. Parliament gives resounding endorsement to Uhuru Raila unity deal and meet grumbling about non-involvement and calls for structured dialogue. This story tucked away on page 4 and 5 of the star this morning and dead end heavy rains. It. Tear our partner Obi Narok Harry will have the details for you. Also, reopen probe of Joho's degree, says DPP. That is a story that you want to follow on page six of the start today. Doctors and nurses confess to KNH brain surgery mix up. You have the story on page two. We'll give you also the gritty details in our news bulletin this morning. The People Daily is up next, and this is your splash today. Why Uhuru Raila opted for dialogue? Key Tinga's aide Salim Lone 
reveals NASA was quickly running out of options while the president was keen to sustain stability, finding lasting solution to ethnic polarization. This story is Dr. William Page for All the People Daily this morning. Also, the happy medium, you can see there a related picture of Raila Odinga and President Uru Kenyatta. Treasury warned against loading 16% VAT on fuel. If the tax is introduced today, in its current form, pump prices will go up by 12 shillings. This story is tucked away on page 17 of the People Daily this morning. We also have the Business Daily for you. And this is your splash today. Kenal Corby pays ex-CEO 500 million shillings in shares claim. It's all about the executive pay. Oil marketer says the out-of-court settlement is part of the reason. Its 2017 profits remained flat at 2.4 billion shillings. Also, IMF gives Kenya six-month standby loan extension. Also, former RVR manager lands top job in SGR's cargo unit. That story tucked away on page four of the Business Daily as well. Looking at the ticker, house team wants 16% tax on fuel delayed. You can follow that on page six of the Business Daily this morning. Taifa Leo is up next. And Kalonzo, Tayari, Ona, Okumona, Okuona, Uhuru. That is what we have as a splash on the front page of Taifa Leo today. We cross over now to Uganda, where we have the Daily Monitor IGG stops Mutebeli's or Mutebiles, I should say, staff changes in BOU. The Ombudsman says the transfers and hiring by Governor Emmanuel Mutebile on February the 7th should be put on a hold as it probes claims that the changes were carried out irregularly. That story continues on page four of the Daily Monitor this morning. Also in Tanzania, we have the citizen for you, and this is a splash. Be fair to taxpayers. Magufuli orders Tanzania Revenue Authority. The head of state says. Taxman should be fair and honest when dealing with taxpayers and other stakeholders. This story tucked away on page two of the Citizen this morning. Also, we do have money interest still in Tanzania. John Pombe Magufuli, Shukia TRA, that is what we have as the splash. John Pombe Magufuli, Shukia TRA. Also, we have the new times in Rwanda. Real estate propels service sector growth. That is what the service sector is doing to Rwanda's economic growth. It says the contribution of services sector to Rwanda's economic growth last year was big owing to real estate. A report by the National Institute of Statistics of Rwanda released on Tuesday shows. This story continues on page 17 of the New Times in Rwanda. Also, we can see here students sit an examination during a mathematics competition that attracted students from 10 science secondary schools in the country. That is in Rwanda. And I want to show you also briefly what we have at this week's uh, the East African Uhuru Raila in Unity Pledge ahead of U.S. Secretary a visit. That is what we have on the front page of East African this week. Maybe I can show you just the editorial cartoon that I have today sent by Munene. Soon, you are fired. And who will be firing himself? Well, I'll leave it for you to decipher. That is uh, Donald Trump there in today's editorial uh, cartoon in the Delhi Nation, according to Munene. Right, let's put this horse into full run as always by looking at the highlights. Young girl killed, two others missing as raging floods sweep away parts of My Mahu Road. 12 year old boys escaped captivity in suspected human trafficking syndicate. Kenneth Medics at pains to explain mistaken brain surgery. Who is happy now? Well, Finland is the world's happiest country. At <laughs> Morning, I'm a young girl died while two of her schoolmates are missing after flash floods rocked parts of Mai Mahi on Wednesday. Meanwhile, the construction of the Mai Mahi Narok Highway is ongoing after a section of the road cracked. Leila Mohammed starts off. Students gather in small crowds discussing in low tones what happened to one of their own. A young lady who was trying to get home after a long school day did not complete her journey. Her body now lies at the Naivasha Hospital morgue. The school principal had detained them in the school waiting for the rains to subside and the flood waters to sip into the earth before he could let them go. Further down the line, the ground is open. The cracks almost five kilometers long and 20 meters deep. The, the foundation of the, that is the earth, sort of moved and that's why we, there's this fault line. So this is not the normal uh, causes of rain, but it's like uh, there was a shift and now which caused the... Um, the, the, the road to crack. 
Six years ago, this very section of the road was affected. 220 meters. Tukazikia hiyo barabara ikona kraki tukivuka. Lakini 20 meters badae ikakatika. Sasa ndiyo tukaona kumekua na ardhi imekatika na imeenda. Sasa upandi ya deep. Sasa ikakua mbele sisi ya tuwezi endelea. Tasa tukagojia wesetu tuambia mpandi hile wasijaribu kufuka sababu maji likuwa inafraya kwa barabara juu. As Mother Nature continues to impose her wrath upon the earth, experts now say there needs to be more expert engagement to ensure that such circumstances do not reoccur in the future. I cannot guarantee. And us may have been responsible for the placing or placing a tag that ruling identified Samuel Washira as John Nderitu, which led to brain surgery wrongly conducted on Nderitu at the Kenyatta National Hospital. The revelation came during a parliamentary health committee setting where health officials who took part in the surgery were questioned. The two patients at the heart of the incident also appeared before the committee. I went in the, in the room Room two called the name of the patient, John Bowe Delito, and responded. I did not receive the patient with the arable. I'm the one who wrote it on a strapping. But the fact that he required blood was based on the patient, uh, uh, the, the patient, the surgery that we're going to do. Oh. Actually, the, the stretcher, they, they don't look for a stretcher for you. You go and look for it. I found my brother, he could not have constructive discussion. And uh, so, and I went to the sisters there, or nurses, and I tried to inquire. Uh, that far, they could not give me information. Now, the family of 12-year-old Ryan Waweru, who went missing for 10 days, can give a sigh of relief after his son escaped from his captors and returned home on Tuesday. Ryan says he was abducted by two men who proceeded to lock him up in an unused warehouse in Nairobi's pipeline area for 10 days before he gained his freedom. Ryan's strange abduction did not come with ransom demands and it's the only one of its kind in the area. He was abducted by two guys. I don't remember the type of a car. I don't remember the name because he's a very sharp boy. He can tell the type of a car it was. I don't remember, but he told me. He told me one was a, a tall, dark guy. And they took him. Then all he can remember, he was the entire time he was somewhere in where he could see Taj Mall. Kwenda kuweka posters, tumeweka kile mahali. Huku kwetu, wakuna mahali ya tujaweka posters. Na tuko tunamtafuta mpaka kwa homes. Kama kunaweza kuwa kuna mtoto amepotea na labda ameogopa haongei. Lakini hiyo yote hakuna mahali, mahali tuyente tukampata. Sasa mambo ikiwa ni mbaya ni mbaya. Lazima sasa tukabiriane na ayo vile ya, 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 ya amu. Nikaamua niende hospitali. Nikaanzia kayore. Mamarusi, kinyata. Mwisho ya nikaona sita pita mochari. Manake sasa siku za saba na fikiri hata kwa mtu wa kawaida mambo ya kienda murama sana. Siku saba uwaga ziko inafu. Okay, the one guy came back, he was drunk. So when he came back, he came and slept. And slept on the floor, he was too drunk. That is when he was able to escape. And he told me when he escaped, he saw that there was a poster written somewhere, Tasia, in Bakasi. There was someone who was vain there. And uh, Tasia is somewhere here in Pipeline. And he told me he was able to walk from there because he told me he really got tired. He was very, he was very hungry. Nedofika, match. Alikuwa meria match. Okay, imefura. Ata sayi na tumia da. Uo munda wote alikuwa mepotea. Tulipigua simu tatu amaine. Tumepigua mpaka na wanabi. Wale wanajita wanabi wa mungu. Wengine wame tu kimbiza kiambu. Wengine wame tu kimbiza jiai. Wengine na tuambia. Tuende kwa mulima, mambo mingi. Na wale nao wataperi, 
kuna mmoja alituambia kuna mtoto wako tinganga Now the Orange Democratic Movement now says it will support Jubilee's development agenda as long as the ruling party is of course in return supports calls for reforms. This emerged even as Parliament debated a motion seeking a bipartisan support for the initiative to build bridges kick started by Odinga and President Uru Kenyatta. Kenyans are used to where when two political groupings come together that we only come together to share positions. Correct. Mr. Speaker, I want to be very clear that this meeting of minds is to talk about the reforms that we have been working uh, all along and total democracy and the development of this country. This deal does not and will not be equated to a coalition government. And at the moment, the deal is still very young. It's just one page. So we are yet to see more. I thought on Friday when Huru spoke and Raila Odinga, the right honorable, spoke, the whole of Kenya spoke. Yes. Speaker, the whole of Kenya spoke. Speaker, I don't know what the problem is. As chairman of ODM, that ODM has decided not to take any blackmail again going forward. And beginning now, we are not going to accept to take unnecessary blackmail that we can't understand. When the general says you, you, you retreat, Mr. Speaker, you retreat. And when the general says, Mr. Speaker, you, you resist, you resist. When the general says, Mr. Speaker, you hibernate, you hibernate, Mr. Speaker. And when he says, dialogue, you dialogue, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, the last time I checked in our books and records, the major general that we had in NASA was one Raila Molo Dinga. And these others were lieutenant generals, you know, other low cadre there. I wish to express my commitment to support the government's agenda that will help our economy grow, provide job opportunities for the citizens, and enhance the general welfare of our people. Equally, as a minority party, we shall request the majority party, Mr. Speaker, to support our agenda as we strive to propose and sponsor progressive bills that are going to foster development. All right, and of course, what does also the political uh, development that we know, the happy truce or the happy medium between Raila Odinga and Horobo Uhuru Kenyatta, you know, portend for the manufacturing sector? These are some of the issues that we'll be talking about. We are coming actually from a very long electioneering period, and that also has adversely affected the manufacturing sector. Now, the university don't strike continues. That's according to officials from the University Academic Staff Union who presented their petition to Education Cabinet Secretary Amina Mohammed, the lecturers who protested, say the 2017-2021 collective bargaining agreement was meant to have been concluded in July last year, but the government has continuously failed them. As we are not going to allow higher education to collapse. And we are hopeful that a decision will be made on Friday, whether to either declare the strike illegal or to force the parties back to the negotiation table. Right, and of course I want just also to, again, if you're joining us uh, or introduce our panelists who are here this morning to take us through a raft of issues that we'll be discussing this morning, we have Professor Francis Muller, who is not really on strike, but he will tell us this morning if he's really on strike. He's here with us this, uh, this morning. He's from the Department of Biochemistry. And of course, we're going to be discussing uh, streamlining the manufacturing sector. He'll weigh in from the academia side as well. So, Professor Francis uh, Muller, good morning to you and thank you for joining us this morning. Also, again, I want to introduce Fernandez uh, Barraza, who is a managing director of Ketraco and the vice chairman of ISPAC. Uh, he will tell us also from the energy sector how is manufacturing uh, faring as well. We have Beverly Spencer Obatayimbo. She is the managing director of British American Tobacco Kenya and she's here with us as well. We have Flora Mutai. She's a chairperson of Kenya 
Man Association of Manufacturers. And she'll take us through, of course, what is happening right now in the manufacturing sector as far as advocacy is concerned and what milestone they've made when it comes to making sure they're streamlining the sector as well. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Right, we're eagerly waiting also for Harry Muchangi Njagi to join us as well. He's a regional marketing head. Uh, this is East African region from Mabati Rolling Mills. Right, let's just now delve deeper into it. Professor, it's good to see you. You're not on strike today. Of course, this is not uh, <laughs> in tandem with what we're discussing this morning, right? But are you making any milestone with this collective bargaining agreement? You know, we've been talking about collective bargaining agreement for donkey years now. Or you're not an official, you don't want to comment. And all these people <laughs> from the academia. <laughs> it's very difficult to know whether a professor is on strike or not because his tools of trade are normally up here. Uh -huh. And if he puts them down, then it's very dangerous because if they get soiled, uh -huh. it's very unlikely you'll be able to put them back to, to use. But now, you know, uh, Mr. Fernandez will ask you, then how do we extract that, you know, tool that is in the head now to the student if, yes, it is not being transmitted, right? <laughs> it's normally <laughs> transmitted through a media uh -huh. in class or in the lab or in a workshop. And... Uh, you would normally gauge at the end of the exercise mm -hmm. the product when the students come out whether they are able to do what they were basically uh, taught. So right. the transmission actually takes place almost, I would say, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. And of course, uh, we wish and uh, we pray that, of course, we might uh, see eye to eye with the government, especially as far as the collective bargaining agreement is concerned. So this has been going for quite a long time. And so we hope that, yes, the Gordian knot will be cut finally. Right. <laughs> Let's just hear from uh, Flora Matai. We want to discuss now, of course, we are delving deeper into the topic of the day. The value of Kenya's manufacturing sector has stagnated uh, at 10 percent of the country's GDP for the last 10 years. And the last time I checked, uh, you were actually to grow it by at least 15%. How far have you made this particular milestone? And why are we stagnating? Well, thank you for the question. Just to make a correction, the, the manufacturing sector currently uh, is not actually stagnated at 10. It mm -hmm. is actually on a negative tra trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, last year, 26, well, 2016, the last statistics we mm -hmm. have, we actually did 9.2 um, to the GDP. However, this is on a base that grows. But manufacturing is not growing, of course, as fast as other, other sectors yes. in the economy. Yeah. And there are various reasons for this. One, um, manufacturing needs a competitive environment in yes. which to do business. It needs um, access to markets, and it needs a lot of predictability within the environment mm -hmm. in which it, we actually operate. So that's what we currently do at KAM, is we, we, we try and ensure that we push for having a competitive environment, push for access to markets, and, and push for pre a predictable um, policy and regulatory environment within the manufacturing industry. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. can it be argued that uh, we're actually going through a premature deindustrialization in this context? Because now it's a negative pro uh, uh, you know, trajectory, as you mentioned. Yes. And of course, we know it had stagnated. Now it is actually going down. So yes. where are we headed? We are teetering at, at, the, at the brink of what? Well, it actually is a very dangerous um, um, level place that we are at. And we do thank the government that now they've noticed manufacturing is how to bring real productivity, real jobs, and, and move an economy. So if, if it is not addressed, um, like, you, like you say, we talked about in 2010, we were growing at 5.8%. Mm -hmm. 2016, we were only growing at 2.3%. Mm -hmm. No, 3.5%. Mm -hmm. And somewhere in there, we've actually managed at 2.3%. So definitely, it is an area that needs to, needs to be stabilized. We need to address what drives competitiveness, which is you know, the cost of doing business, cost of energy. Um, you, know, um, you know, do you have the right skill set? Um, there are several things that drive the competitiveness of business that actually need to be addressed by the government. And that's what we want to actually drill deeper on this morning. Let, let's hear from uh, Beverly. Of course, you are a player in this uh, sector. You know now firsthand why, why we have, you know, a, a very constraining business environment. And you know why uh, also some of these contracting uh, and confining issues can you know, be resolved. You've been in the, in the, in the, in the board, you've been also uh, talking to people within the industry. What are you learning so far before we drill deeper into some of the pertinent issues that we'll talk about? Um, yeah, well, I, I've actually only been here for less than a year, actually. Mm -hmm. So I would say that um, 2017 was quite a uni unique year for Kenya. Yes. Um, and the impact of that on businesses was quite unique, I hope. Mm -hmm. um, I, 
I believe that there are some specific issues that, that can be addressed in Kenya which will facilitate yes. mm -hmm. uh, the growth and development of business in Kenya. And these are things that we talk a lot to Flora uh, and the CAM team about, but also to key government officials. So I think the, the challenges that we've had specifically a bit have been about the unpredictability of the fiscal policies, mm -hmm. so excise shocks, very large increases in the cost of tax stamps, uh, and as you mentioned, the infrastructural costs as well, so the cost of electricity, etc. But as a business, we are very focused on on being able to stay in Kenya because we believe it's it's a great place to be, mm -hmm. uh, and we have other initiatives and, a and actions in place that help us to offset some of these higher costs, so the cost of electricity, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but we would really, really like the government to focus in on fiscal and regulatory policy and make sure that those policies are are much more predictable, sustainable and allow for, for businesses to really develop and thrive in Kenya and take advantage of the Comesa and EAC trade blocks. Mm -hmm. Right, so talking of uh, you know, policy issues, uh, tax ref reforms in the sector as well and the cost of energy. I want to come to uh, Barasa. Looking at yesterday's Business Daily, which is actually on my touch screen right now, uh, you see we, we are, they're trying to actually change uh, the perception that we have about uh, the cost of power here in the country and there are fresh attempts to end Kenya power monopoly. Do you actually fly with this idea of ending monopoly within the power sector? I know you are a transmitter of energy so you not be but of course you are in the uh, playing that particular uh, sector. Will you tell us do you think this will be the prime solution in of, of course addressing the issue of the cost of energy in this country? We have power gen who now they come to the fore and other stakeholders as well who want actually to you know take a pie of this monopoly. Well, I'll, I'll give my personal view with regards to uh, the monopoly issue yes, of please. energy power. When you look at the reforms in the energy sector, uh, definitely when we have uh, more players, there will be competition, and then of course with competition, um, you're definitely going to have uh, people getting quality service. Mm -hmm. Uh, looking at what has happened, um, just an example of the telecom uh, industry. Uh, you can clearly see uh, when Safaricom came on board, yes, uh, Airtel, etc. The costs of um, uh, telecommunication has definitely uh, improved, mm -hmm. and also the quality of service. So, personally, I believe um, because of the reforms in the sector, mm -hmm. uh, it is something that um, uh, will definitely, as a consumer. It's a good thing. Of course, um, when we get a competition, uh, it is something that we definitely want to, uh, as a consumer, uh, look forward to. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you look at what Kenya Power, the position of Kenya Power right now, uh, by virtue of being 51% um, government owned, there are many other concessional uh, uh, priorities which are passed over to the consumers, especially when you look at the costs of uh, construction of uh, the distribution network, mm -hmm. uh, by virtue of government uh, having a key uh, a stake, yes. uh, some of the loans we get are concessional loans mm -hmm. as opposed to commercial uh, uh, loans, which definitely uh, also have an impact on the, on, on the tariff. Mm -hmm. So I can say uh, it's a double-edged sword. When you look at it from the consumer perspective, uh, it may uh, basically bring some bit of competition and also improve the quality of mm -hmm. service. All right. But of course, we know uh, this is uh, like the Kenya Power right now controls like 50.1% of the utility uh, shares and the other uh, shares, we have them with the private, set, uh, private investors holding the rest, of course. Uh, the reason that electricity cost increases are difficult maybe to judge. You will tell us just uh, uh, recently, beginning of January, we know people have been con you know, complaining about some of the tokens they buy. You know, they fluctuate and we wonder why this is happening, especially uh, because you can buy within the same month units, but, you know, with the same pricing or the same amount, but you get different tokens. And they've been at pains to explain this, right? Do you think uh, maybe the way the, the, the energy sector right now, because it's really pegged on the geothermal and uh, you know, hydro, hydropower electricity, what could be a contributing factor? Is this the price of fuel or we, we've never really understood? Because you have your fixed rate and they say the fixed charge, which is among the most stable items of a bill, caters for the cost of billing or vending prepaid tokens. Uh, we wonder if the vending of the prepaid tokens was before done by the Kenya Power and right now it has outsourced. Uh, then 
was that also really adding to the cost of power? I know this is not really right up your alley, but I, I will put you to task because you are in that sector. So you're the only guy, you're the only fall guy that I can go to to tell me more about this. Well, uh, first and foremost, I want to um, just make it clear that I may not be competent to um, comment on the, the cost of tokens because I really wished we had my colleague, uh, yes. Dr. Akenta Ros. That I understand. But generally, uh, with regard to the cost of power, uh, we have monthly reviews yes. of um, the cost, which is definitely done by uh, the regulator ERC, and largely is dependent on the FCC, the fuel cost charge. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the price of uh, fuel, definitely is uh, international uh, prices. So when we get those changes happening internationally, it has a, a direct impact uh, on the cost of uh, power. Mm -hmm. Uh, largely, when you look at the bill, um, of course, FCC is a very uh, key component, around 20% of the cost. So anyhow, when we have uh, a change in the oil prices, and when, of course, looking at the fact that uh, we are doing around 30% um, uh, of um, uh, thermal energy, uh, definitely has an impact uh, on the cost of, right. of power because our energy mix largely is hydro. But, of course, you'll, you'll agree with me that uh, for the past six months we've had droughts. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we have a lot of droughts, uh, we now tend to use more of thermal energy. And the more thermal energy used because it's fuel driven, it would definitely increase um, that tariff. In fact, in the, in the tariff structure, mm -hmm. uh, the cost of thermal is the highest, mm -hmm. almost at 20 shillings um, uh, uh, per kilowatt hour, as compared to hydro, which is at five uh, shillings per kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. So the more you use thermal, definitely has an impact on the tariff. But what we are doing now is to make sure that we go now into renewable energy. Renewable energy. Yeah, which is more stable and also cheaper. Right, so we'll talk about uh, renewable energy uh, much, much later in the course of the program. But it's a pity that, yes, uh, we know Kenya sits in the league of the top 10 world's largest producers of geothermal energy, yet uh, here it, you mentioned it's very costly. We don't really understand why it is very costly. You pegged it on my, maybe the fuel uh, that is, you know, vacillating up and down all the time. But we are losing our competitive edge due to the high cost of energy. And, of course, you can allude to this because many farms, I'm given to understand, and we've mentioned this even here before, that within the last five good years, SMEs have folded here in the country. Five million, you know, SMEs have folded because of the high cost of, uh, you know, energy in, the, in this country. Also, the conducive business environment, the dead hand of bureaucracy, uh, as far as they can say, yes, Kenya has improved in uh, going milestone uh, in actually making sure that we have a very conducive uh, business environment mm -hmm. as it is. But from your own uh, perspective, mm -hmm. are you feeling the pinch? Mm -hmm. Or are you also sharing the benefit of having this uh, particular conducive business environment that the World Bank is alluding to, that we've improved? Um, yes, we have improved on um, certain aspects of um, doing business, like registering, registering a company. Yes. I think there was something to do with um, transferring of land. Um, there, there are various tenants in, in the cost of doing business that Kenya has improved. Mm -hmm. but. I would, I would say it is still quite a, a non-conducive place to do business and, and there are a lot of areas um, that need to be addressed. For example, if we could take the, the most recent one that is affecting a lot of people, which was um, the cost of capital. The cost of capital. Yes. Well, f well, first it was the cost of capital, then came the interest rate cap, but then what tended to happen is then we lost a lot of um, business. I mean, sorry, we lost a lot of credit within the market. We noticed a whole credit shrink, especially the SME was being unable completely to... To, to access credit because the bankers would then look at it and say, listen, I'm, it's cheaper for me perhaps right now to lend to the government because we have the government actually borrowing in the same pool that the, local, that the locals are actually borrowing from. So therefore it made access to capital, which I believe is one of the most important tenants to doing mm -hmm. business, um, you, know, you, know, you know, to succeed. The other area that um, competitiveness uh, that we, um, uh, affects a lot of business is w the coming of devolution, which we appreciate. You know, we, yes, there are 47 now, now centers of what you'd say power and um, investment. But there's been a lot of multiple levies. So mm -hmm. when I move from one county to another on, on marketing, on distribution, it has brought in a lot of levies and a lot of um, different ways of doing businesses, which have also cost a lot of the businesses. Uh, another area that um, has um, affected um, manufacturing businesses is, is actually payment. We call it prompt payment of, um, from the public, um, private and public. 
private, we know the retail sector has been struggling for the last couple of years and are taking, on average, 60 to 90 days mm -hmm. to, to make payment, yes. some 120, and we do know of even some who have not paid in 365 days. Mm -hmm. That is one of the biggest things that has affected especially the SME, because the SME is, 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 is literally, you know, has enough capital to make the product, sell, get your money back, and, and, and go back. So when you look at the turning of the coin, it doesn't actually turn enough times within a year. When, when you have the turning of the coin to be two to three times in a year, yes. that, does not, that it does not make business sense. So well, you, you tend to find um, the, pro, the payment. And the other area that payment is not being made, of course, is, is the government and the county governments. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they came and said, yes, youth and women get into business, supply, supply, um, you know, get into supply trading, manufacturing. But when you don't pay these people, then you know they fold. I know a lot of people who have actually folded their businesses and gone back to employment and said, "This is not for me." Mm -hmm. Whereas it's just unfortunately, you know, few areas that um, that need to be addressed. And we are happy that you know we have this conversation, you know, in, in able to in, to be able to spark um, manufacturing within the economy. Right. Uh, before we take a short break, let me just also uh, uh, rope in Professor and ask you because we, the mar marine uh, also economy has not been really tapped in this country and it's, it's a high time that we actually diversify uh, and we know that to achieve strong and sustainable economic growth uh, Kenya has to diversify our resources of growth by pursuing the blue economy tell us briefly before now we take a short break because we'll actually drill deeper on these matters that have been raised on the other side of a break uh, where do we think we are right now because I think we uh, we are given to understand only 0.5 percent of a gross domestic product uh, can be accounted to the uh, fishing or fisheries account and uh, we know this can also generate employment for over 2 million Kenyans. But we have a, a, th a very thorny issue that even right now Kenya is exporting fish from China, right? Given the 0.5% of a gross domestic product, do you think well, actually we're doing justice also to our blue economy with this one slice or the facet of it looking at the fishing industry? Very briefly. The way to develop the maritime economy is not through uh, looking at it in terms of fishing or fish. It's through engineering. How do you build or how is Kenya's engineering uh, or engineers, what are they doing? Because the way you, you build the economy, it has to be a hol holistic. Now, if you look at most of the countries that have developed, actually the economy is built around water. If you look at towns like London, uh, Paris, all the big towns, it's around water. Now, in Kenya or in Africa, we seem to fear water. Okay? And that basically also means then that is the biggest frontier. Yes. You can triple this economy if you put the resources you are putting on land in water. The Indian Ocean, uh, all the, the, the lakes we, we have, the rivers, Lake Victoria, all those basically at the end of the day you have to make them into uh, a resource. Now, the way the other countries have done is normally through the universities you start building your engineering uh, faculty around a theme. Now in Kenya, for example, now we have found oil and gas. So you build the engineering around oil and gas, because yes. oil and gas can finance and fund the training. Now, once you have enough engineers, those engineers will then basically be able to take you to the sea. Because to go to the sea is not, you cannot make a mistake mm -hmm. uh, with a boat. Because you, basically, it's death. Mm -hmm. So by the time you have engineers who can put you at sea, they are tested, they are robust. Then you can build boats. We have capacity to build boats. I don't know why we are not building boats. We have capacity to build ferries. We have capacity to, we need to have capacity to drill under the sea. Right now, people are only drilling water wells. That is not why you train an engineer. Mm -hmm. An engineer, we should have many engineering firms with rigs. Most of our universities who have engineering programs, they don't have even a single rig. Okay? 
we should be able basically to have those so that if they are not drilling for oil and gas or drilling under the sea, those rigs then will be used to drill for water so that water becomes a beneficiary of the engineer of idle engineering capacity. Right. So our engineering is still very, very rudimentary. And we need basically to put a lot of resources into that because once you have that, then those boats are the ones that will fish. Right. But if you approach it from the fishing angle that you want to go and bring fish, Thank you. then you have everything wrong because Thank you. it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. But of course, so we, we also have to give kudos to other, you know, yesterday we had the news that, yes, they have built the first boat uh, assembled here in the country. It's taken over five years, but finally it's here. So at least we're doing something also in the marine economy. You can't really bash them that way. Yeah? <laughs> uh, but again, also, we, we have to look also at, uh, also when you're talking about rigs uh, that we don't have them in the universities, we never knew that one day also will strike oil in this country, right? So this really came from the left side. You know, so we're still like, putting our hands in order, don't you think? Very briefly, very we briefly. We can do much better than that. We can do much better we than that. We can do much, much better. You'll tell that. us how, right? On the other side of a break, of course, we want to know from uh, Professor how we can do much better on the, of course, marine economy. And also we'll be looking deeper on some of these issues that have been raised here by our panelists uh, from uh, the manufacturing sector, the tax uh, implementation and the policy as well is affecting uh, the players. As well, the energy sector, we just touched the surface, we drill deeper on the other side of a break. Remember to hit us on Twitter, AM Live NTV is a Twitter handle, AM Live NTV is a profile name on Facebook and 20505, our SMS portal. So let's get your reactions as well on social media. And of course, we shall also relay that to our panelists to answer them and of course also share uh, their opinion on what they think some of the questions or contributions uh, are saying. Right, we take a short, break, a short break right now. It is seven on the nose. See you on the other side of the break.
Welcome back. You're watching AM Live in the Market. Of course, this morning we are continuing with our discussion here. And of course, we know that we sit in a privileged position. We are the fifth largest economy in sub-Saharan Africa. We have a well-educated labor force. Our financial services and information technology capabilities are amongst the most developed in the region. And our infrastructure is the most advanced among peers as well. Substantial further investment being planned. We know that. And we have access also to vast agricultural resources and a home to some of the most innovative entrepreneurs globally. Despite these advantages, our manufacturing sector has remained stagnant at least at 11% of the GDP over the past 10 years. As a result, the number of former jobs in manufacturing has grown at just 7% per year over the past four years. Our exports have stagnated at 15% of the GDP, while inputs have grown to 40% of the GDP, creating a trade imbalance, weakening the Kenyan shilling and increasing inflationary pressure. These gaps can only be closed by revitalizing our industrial or our industrial sector and turning Kenya into an industrial hub. And of course, I have created FaceTime this morning with Fernandez Baranza, who is the managing director of Kenya Electricity Transmission Company. Also, we do have with us uh, here in the studio, Beverly. Beverly, she is the Beverly Spencer. She's uh, the managing director of British American Tobacco Kenya. We do have with us with us uh, this morning as well, Farah Mutai. She is the chairperson of Kenya Association of Manufacturers. And we have also as well, Professor Francis Muller from the University of Nairobi, Department of Biochemistry, and we're drilling deeper on these issues that we are raising that are pertinent as far as streamlining the manufacturing sector is concerned. So remember to cross over all to our Twitter handle, AM Live NTV is a Twitter handle, AM Live NTV is a profile name on Facebook, and 20505 is our SMS portal. All right, let, let's go to you. Uh, Flora, because we want to also drill deeper on uh, some of the issues that you raised that are very pertinent, first of all. Uh, given that uh, we have the cost of power, that we, it is rising exponentially every day, what from your own estimation should be the prime solution? Because we want to look at some of the solutions as well. In tandem, of course, we know uh, on some of the advocacy uh, highlights that you've raised mm -hmm. as far as the Kenya Association of uh, Manufacturers mm -hmm. is concerned. Mm -hmm. let's, let's, let's tackle the cost of power. Okay. The cost of power has actually come from 18 um, US cents. I think it dropped to 14 US cents. Yes. But what, of course, we are requesting as manufacturers is to have it drop to about an average of about 9 US cents. Mm -hmm. And somewhere like Ethiopia, we know we have it at about 3 or 4 US cents. Um, for industries that are very, uh, that use a lot of energy, which is major, well, a lot of industries do use um, whatever, cost of, having a low cost of power, of course, will, will hit Im immediately on their bottom line, which then make, makes us competitive, because you do realize, as we are growing, um, or, or we attempt to grow manufacturing in Kenya from the 9.2% mm -hmm. um, to 15, we are going to have to look at export markets. We are a global economy, so we are competing with international international brands. We're e competing with India and China mm -hmm. and um, all other manufactured goods. So the lower and the more competitive we can bring our cost of energy, then um, that that way, then we'll be able to bring the cost of goods and, and um, increase our markets. Mm -hmm. So so it's 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 about generating enough power. It's about generating um, quality power that we can then give to our people and. Um, be able to then bring down the cost of manufacturing. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Yeah, Beverly. Yeah, I could maybe just um, add to some of Flora's comments. Um, I think the cost of power coming down would be fantastic for most uh, large manufacturing industries as well. Um, I, I think it's one of the biggest line items that we have uh, as, as a business. And also the instability of power at times can be a big challenge. It damages machineries. Um, we have to have in place other power sources like generators, which are hugely expensive. Um, so, but that said, I think there are some steps in the right direction with the reduction in the mm -hmm. rate during the night time for yes, some yes, factories yes. Uh, to 50% of, of the normal rate. But that poses different challenges for us. Mm -hmm, Not mm -hmm. all factories want to be manufacturing during the night time and you have to pay larger salaries to people for working on sociable hours. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a whole raft uh, of challenges, I think, for the, for the government there to make the environment much more conducive and encourage people to set up businesses here uh, in Kenya. So uh, c companies that we give it to the start that operate 100% capacity daily with uh, no room to, inc uh, to increase operations and uh, lift their power intake enjoy only 5% a discount instead of the 50%. Those are some of the things that we do not understand how also, uh, uh, the Kenya Power is actually you know, offering with these particular tariffs. 
Yeah. Right. So what, what has been uh, maybe your remedial measure to try and address this? Because it doesn't make sense. It seems, yes, it's a good a boon for the, uh, for, for, for the manufacturing sector, but it doesn't make any leak of sense because, yeah. yes, given 100% and of course that tariff and uh, having it from 6, I think, to, is it 6 to 10 a.m.? Uh, yeah. Uh, it's, it's from 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. Yes, yeah. Actually, it's from 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. Yes. That is even frustrating. Yeah. Uh -huh. Tell us more about that. <laughs> so, sorry. Go yeah, on. Beverly. Yeah. Um, I, was, uh, I, I think uh, the challenges that, that we have in, in, in the electricity space are just one of the challenges. Yes. So I, I, I think we would take advantage of, of the additional reduced costs mm -hmm. uh, where it's possible. But, but as I said, a lot of our teams would... Uh, would not be willing to work on sociable hours or would be demanding higher salaries. So in a way, you sort of offset the difference with other costs, which becomes a challenge. Uh, but outside of that, as a, as a business, I mean, we have the benefit of being part of a bigger BAT group. Uh, and we put in place some, some huge investments to try and drive our own productivity so mm -hmm. that also we can then offset any larger increases in local costs. So we have something called integrated work systems which we run in our factories to really drive down our cost base, make, make us much more efficient uh, and effective. And this is what allows us to offset any, any fluctuations in the cost of doing business locally. So we have to put these things in place so that we can get more predictability to the way that we do our business. Mm -hmm. All right, cut tariff. Uh, you can weigh in, uh, Mr. Yeah. Baraza. Very yeah, briefly. definitely. Um, I just wanted to weigh in on some three aspects about um, uh, stability and reliability because I know for the big manufacturers, the issue of uh, reliability is very important. Yes. Now, what we are doing as government uh, through Ketraco is to invest in um, high voltage transmission lines, mm -hmm. uh, where high voltage I'm talking about 132 kV and above. We have already energized the first 400 kV. Uh, which was done last year. That was Mombasa, Nairobi. And we've seen some significant improvements. Uh, when we talk to our cement manufacturers in Atriva, they're giving us a positive a story because they have not experienced any blackouts. What that means is uh, we need to invest more uh, into the 400 kV uh, transmission lines. Uh, we're also investing a lot in uh, 132 kVs, basically to enhance accessibility. Mm -hmm. And also to invest a lot in transmission lines so that we uh, move away from using uh, thermal energy. Uh, a very good example is when we energized uh, Kindaruma Mwingi line through Garissa. Yes. Uh, we have very good uh, stories in Garissa, for example, because they were relying largely on uh, fuel generators. Now they're getting uh, clean energy from Kindaruma. Mm -hmm. So it's a big story. So issues about stability are definitely. Uh, the investment in the transmission network is going to address that. Uh, the cost of um, power, as I said, once we now move into renewable energy, which is slightly cheaper, uh, between uh, 5 to 7 US cents, and then we, of course, reduce uh, over-reliance on hydro, reduce over-reliance on thermal, uh, definitely that will also have a, a positive impact on the cost of, uh, uh, of power. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, uh, Professor, you want to weigh in on the cost of power uh, briefly? I, I am not a manufacturer, but <laughs> You're I, an I have felt <laughs> uh, one of the things I, I found out is the quality of power is extremely poor. If you are running any big machinery, <sighs> my, my equipment in the lab has broken down many, many times, and it's normally happens uh, in December uh, between 23rd and about 5th, 23rd of December and 5th of January. Most of my heavy equipment, if I have left them on, they basically, because very, very poor quality of power during that time. Now, I cannot imagine what happens to the big manufacturers who have big machines. So that needs to be improved, even if uh, the reliability, even if it is just for a short time, you are, but the quality is such that basically you can operate a machinery on. And as I was saying, eventually we will just have to bite the bullet. We need to go to have nuclear uh, power because so that the sales to the so-called consumer lighting is basically secondary, mm -hmm. so that the revenue for this 
man, uh, what do you call generators is not from household, it is basically from manufacturing. Then the other people, whether it's universities and other institutions, they can get power cheaply because it is like uh, the, the leftovers. They have already made their profit, so the rest excess is then sold to household. Then power will be cheap and viable. But if they want to get their, power, their money from the, the lighting in the house and then of course it will be very expensive. <coughs> All right. All right. Uh, let's hear from you also, Flora, because data from the Kenya uh, or CAM indicates that the farms have put 100% of the day and night capacity to work. And as I mentioned, they're leaving only no headroom or, uh, to increase output or hire more workers. So is it actually of how exceed, uh, exceeding, exceedingly beneficial value is actually this particular tariff to, to the manufacturers? Because you've heard from uh, Beverly, it doesn't make any lick, lick of sense uh, to them. Now, I, I, I was given to understand it was 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Now Beverly has a different story as well. It is 1 a.m. Uh, tell us more about this before we drill deeper now to diversifying our, uh, our energy sector. The easiest way to understand it is to look at Kenya Power as a business. So what they, uh, I believe when they brought in this incentive, they didn't want people to move from, let's say, we'll close our day jobs and we'll go and actually manufacture within the, within the night. It's supposed to be for incremental manufacturing. So if you have a, a you know, a, you, you have your, you're running your eight hours or 16 hour shift, yes. it's supposed to incentivize the nighttime tariff. You know, the nighttime tariff is supposed to incentivize for you to increase your, your production. And if they bring the cost of manufacturing down for, I mean, of energy down for, yes. for and, and it's, like you've heard from her, it's one of the biggest lines, mm -hmm. then we, we, the, we, the idea was to actually spur um, increased manufacturing. That was the reason. So if you look at it from Kenya Power's point of view, because this was done several years ago, I think several, I mean, two or three decades ago. Yes. And um, they had, you know, just a plain out nighttime tariff. Mm -hmm. And you tended to find factories then say, okay, let me close during the day and, and manufacture <laughs> during the night. Mm -hmm. Which is not really a bad idea because they get off the grid and there's no competition. But the idea of this one was to actually just spur manufacturing. Spur manufacturing. Yeah. All right. So how do we di diversify? Because you mentioned maybe the nuclear energy is the way to go right now. And I'm given to understand the Kenya Nuclear Electricity Board expects to begin construction of uh, Kenya's first nuclear plant uh, or power plant by 2024. We wanted to know from, from the perspective of Ketraco right now, what are you doing? Because you'll be the distributor. Are you also in the pipeline? Because I'm given to understand that they have a strategy. How have you been working in tandem with the board as far as also transmission of this uh, or the way you're going to evacuate this power and transmit it to uh, Mona Inchi? Of, or, or, yeah, give us the, 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 the framework that you have, first of all, and yeah. uh, what are some of uh, the plans that you have up the collective sleeves as far as uh, distributing this power is concerned? Uh, first and foremost, I just wanted to uh, give Prof some assurance with regard to the quality of power. Uh -huh. uh, what we are doing uh, is to invest a lot into uh, substations around Nairobi. Uh -huh. We have um, around four substations um, for 220 kV. Uh, in Komarok, mm -hmm. we have some substations in uh, Suswa, and then we also have uh, substations in Atriva, uh, largely referred to as Nairobi Ring. So in the next two years, uh, definitely we're trying to improve the stability and quality of power within Nairobi mm -hmm. and the environs. Even in Fika, we're also looking at having 400 kV substations in Gilgil, so that all the manufacturing around Nairobi and the environment is improved. So that is something that, Prof, you can be sure um, you'll see a difference. Uh, with regard to diversification, yes. um, definitely as the energy sector players, uh, any time there is a proposal uh, for any uh, generation, we definitely have uh, a conversation on how that power is going to be evacuated. So we already have plans, uh, uh, which we are working in tandem with the uh, Kenya Nuclear Electricity Board. Of course, we want as much as possible not to have a stranded investment uh, for generation. Mm -hmm. So we have a committee uh, within uh, the energy sector, which basically harmonizes the programs uh, for generation and transmission. By the way, track is largely uh, transmission. Distribution is done by Kenya Power. Mm -hmm. And the transmission beats the various aspects. We have evacuation of power. We have um, rural access. We also have uh, electrification for strengthening the network, and then we have regional interconnection. Mm -hmm. So that's basically where uh, we are playing in terms of supporting the energy uh, sector. 
All right. And of course, there has been a bugbears and fears about radiation and all, briefly, before we drilled yeah. to other, I want us to adjust <coughs> to the power sector. And uh, in light of that, I know maybe this may not also be right up your alley, but we have also Joseph Maina, uh, who's the acting chief officer uh, of the Radiation Protection Board, uh, assuring Kenyans that... Uh, uh, concerning safety, security, and disposal of waste from nuclear energy, that one is taken care of. But we wonder, in light of insecurity, especially, you know, with the threat of Al-Shabaab, uh, the site also has been one of a very pivotal concern. You as, you know, uh, people who are transmitting this uh, electricity, uh, evacuating, uh, of course, from the nuclear plants, now distributing them also to uh, Kenyans as well. Uh, how are you involved in terms of, uh, you know, uh, looking at the site and uh, having, uh, you know, a suitable construction site for this particular nuclear, nuclear plant. <coughs> Very briefly. Well, in terms of uh, security, of course, um, most of the substations we're doing um, a very good example is Fuswa substation, uh, 220 kV, that is already up and running. We'll be having almost five um, lines transmitting and terminating at Suswa. <laughs> and, uh, of course, we have also having uh, discussions with um, uh, national security. So we have a committee that addresses the security issues uh, mm -hmm. around substations, uh, which I can assure you is um, we have taken on board all the security concerns. Uh, of course, uh, the threat of Al Shabaab is a uh, very dynamic. Yes. Uh, but one thing I can assure uh, the panel here is um, we are working very closely uh, with the National Intelligence Service and also our security agencies just to make sure that we mitigate um, the security threats right. around uh, substations. You remember last year, we had an incident in Lamu, yes. where one of our towers was blown. Mm -hmm. But we had a very quick <coughs> response for, for rectifying that problem. But going forward, of course, we are looking at proactive uh, measures of how to secure the substations. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. And what I'm wondering is also some of you are the stakeholders, uh, players in this industry, because we have uh, Stephen Motoro from the Consumer mm -hmm. Federation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, raising concerns. How also are the stakeholders involved from the Kenya uh, Association of Manufacturers, you know, BET also coming? They really want to have a, you know, clean energy, cheaper energy from the academia as well. Mm -hmm. How are the stakeholders involved? Very briefly from you and then from Beverly and also from Peter, then we drill deeper also to matters of uh, uh, policy issues, tax reforms and regimes as well. Let's hear from you briefly. Okay. CAM has been very much on the forefront for green energy yes. and um, renewable energy. We've taken the forefront. We have a lot of um, even NGOs and funds that we work with to actually promote it among our, 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 our players. We also run what you call um, an energy efficiency um, program that we run with, with, for the ministry, and uh, which actually culminates into giving awards. So we actually encourage our manufacturing yes. firms to actually save, save on energy. So I would say it's a two-pronged approach. We, the ones who are using it, we make sure they use it efficiently, and we are very, very much on the forefront for developing um, re renewable energy. <laughs> Right, Beverly. Yeah, actually, we've, we're one of the recipients of the awards, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so that's a good, a good uh, prompt from Flora. Um, I, I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, it's important that you look at many different options in order to try and bring your cost base down, but also look at other forms of renewable or cleaner energy, uh, and that's something that we're very focused on uh, as a business. And actually, last year we won some awards in the uh, in the in the green area mm. in terms of our energy usage, and you'd be surprised about that for such a big factory mm -hmm. uh, but no so we focus on this quite quite strongly um, so I, I would be interested to be uh, part of any discussions about what future opportunities mm -hmm. would be in the energy space and, and we're very closely connected to, to CAM so we get good visibility of what the future opportunities would be um, you know, but uh, I think every manufacturer has to take some responsibility themselves as well and an attempt to drive down their energy usage and use the most ecologically friendly sources available. Right. And of course, also the big on the table, right, uh, or the buzzword is the corporate, uh, you know, citizenship right now, especially from, uh, you know, big players uh, like BET as well, because we know you take a lot from the environment, then how are you giving back to the environment as well? And the aspect of integrated thinking also is really coming to the fore as well. We wonder from the point view of sustainability then what are some of the interventions that you're coming up with because now you know we are getting away from the corporate corporate social responsibility that yes you take from the environment then you come and uh, have some bags of unga and bags of maybe a bell of uh, 
uh, you know, uh, maybe a clothes given to, to the poor, and then you call national media group, you say, hey, we need to have some Kodak moment, corporate social responsibility, we see you in the business pictorials, but that is actually changing so far. When you take from the environment, right, maybe from the manufacturers, <coughs> who, for, is, for instance, who are planting the tobacco, yeah. right, uh, there are big issues like uh, child labor, there are big issues uh, like, you know, uh, some of the fertilizers that are being used, how are they adversely affecting the environment? From your policy point of view, you as a manufacturer, you as actually a BET and a manufacturer of, uh, of course, uh, you know, cigarettes as well. Yeah. Could you tell us what is your uh, green buying and the green policy, yeah. um, um, you know, uh, docket? How does it look? Um, it's, it's a very good docket. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're actually registered on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index uh, okay. based on our sustainability agenda uh, and, and basically trying to make sure that everything that we do is extremely well governed uh, and falls within the local jurisdictions. So whatever the laws of the land are, you stay within those laws. I would say that as a, as a company in Kenya, we go above and beyond mm -hmm. uh, that. So first of all, we have a very big focus on afforestation. As you know, there are a lot of trees that have been mm -hmm. cut down over the years. Since 1978, we've actually planted 50 million trees uh, in, in Kenya, along with the Kenyan Forestry Commission. Uh, on average, we do about 2 million trees uh, a year. And to stop the farmers from using the trees to, to burn, to make charcoal, to process the tobacco leaf, we've also set up a briquetting uh, processing factory. So we use waste sugar cane to produce briquettes. So now most of our farmers will be using briquettes and not cutting down trees. Mm -hmm. It is a crop that is quite intensive. Uh, so we actually import all of our fertilizers, pesticides, they are of a, a, a very, very high standard, so globally certified, uh, so that we minimize the impact uh, in the spaces where we do business. We have 5,000 farmers mm -hmm. uh, working with us who work closely with our agricultural experts in BAT to make sure that our impact on, on the land is minimal. Um, and then in, over the last couple of years we've also been giving certified maize seeds to the farmers so that they can crop rotate so that we don't bleed uh, the ground so the tobacco is in and we crop rotate with certified uh, crops that they can then use for food, sustainable food. All right. Let's say from uh, your professor as well, from the academia, you're looking at the sustainability aspect of it, uh, of having the manufacturers, we have also the, the, the power sector. Mm -hmm. We are going green because the environment is bleeding. We are actually crying here in the country that you know of deforestation is adversely affecting us. So the global warming is with us. We, it's a reality on the ground. But what are some of all, you know some of the research uh, and uh, development uh, that maybe you as a, from the academia have been uh, trying to fund for, as, especially in light of what is happening? I think that is one of the areas where academia can make the biggest uh, contribution because. This century, actually, the, most of the manufacturing is going to be uh, biological. The biosciences, the bioeconomy is going to be basically the driving force. And the good thing about the, the manufacturing using uh, the, the biological or the biosciences is that, first of all, you consume very little electricity. The efficiency is extremely high. And uh, then there is very little environmental pollution. I have just heard her talking about uh, the use of uh, pesticides in, uh, in uh, tobacco. Mm -hmm. I would really love to team up with, uh, with you so that we move from uh, pesticides, the chemical, into uh, biopesticides because it's huge and extremely effective and that is an area of growth which even you could uh, benefit. I'll, I'll just add, I'll comment on that. Um, we're very aware of that, and, and we actually have a biopesticide group within the company, so we'd be more than happy uh, to have some uh, discussions about that. Then you have the old chemical lenders. I think uh, when most of us grew up, when you drove on Mombasa Road, there were all these chimneys billowing smoke, and yes. basically they were boiling and cooking things. That is no longer there, and the reason is that most of the boiling and the cooking that used to, be, uh, to happen, now you can do it w without boiling and cooking. Mm -hmm. And uh, mo quite a number of industries actually need to take uh, that route. Enzymes are extremely efficient. Mm -hmm. I can see 
some of your big manufacturers like Kenya breweries are now brewing beer using enzymes where they used to do malting and all those things. And uh, it also gives you a, an opportunity. Now they can put beer on the, on the table, which used to take maybe five, six days to ferment. They, if the demand arises, they can put that beer on the market in two days and it will be exactly the same beer. So that is eventually uh, the route to go. That might not be very good for, <laughs> for the, the power generators, but, <laughs> <laughs> but maybe they can also diversify and exactly. invest into this new bio, uh, bio economy so that they have other sources of uh, basically revenue so that they don't have to levy us so much trying to sell us electricity that uh, basically doesn't uh, make economic sense. Yeah, and maybe uh, <laughs> Fernandez, you can tell us more about that. And uh, yeah, I will ask you also another question that will close this chapter on power. We come also to uh, policy issues, uh, you know, tax regimes mm -hmm. as well, very briefly. Maybe just to also uh, weigh in on the stakeholders. The stakeholders, uh, yes. Before I comment on the uh, cogent. One of the key stakeholders we have identified is the members of the fourth estates as the energy sector. And we have a program that we run on an annual basis at the Energy Journalism Awards, where we recognize uh, members of the fourth estate who report on energy issues. Oh. We regularly um, arrange to have um, breakfast meetings just to inform uh, um, the members of the fourth estates because we believe information is power. Uh, what we have seen, of course, is uh, improved reporting, uh, improved journalism, uh, of course, uh, bold highlighting issues on the energy sector. And that is something that we uh, believe is very good uh, going forward, just to augment uh, the efforts by CAREACAM uh, and also the Kenya Private Sector Alliance. Mm -hmm. So journalism and um, for the state is a key stakeholder. We are also partnering with um, all the project affected persons. Mm -hmm. Of course, we involved in a lot of CSR programs uh, because largely when you have the high voltage lines uh, traversing uh, most of the land parcels, uh, most of those affected persons also want to be um, uh, recognized and also to fill their part and parcel of that project. We have partnered with our sister company, Rare, mm -hmm. uh, to do some uh, rural electrification programs because you know the high voltage lines don't uh, connect to the rurals, but we have programs now where now we partner with Rare so that we can also be involved in lighting up uh, the homes of all the project affected persons. We are doing schools for them. Mm -hmm. We are doing water panels, especially in the north. Uh, we are also doing uh, hospitals just to make sure that um, the locals feel part and parcel of Ketraco. Uh, with regard to cogen, of course, we are encouraging um, uh, manufacturers. We have a lot of um, um, cogeneration in the sugar factories. We also, of course, having uh, uh, programs to encourage uh, biomass, which is one of the source uh, of electricity, although it's a small scale. But so far, we have almost around um, uh, 30 megawatts uh -huh. uh, coming from cogen and, and biomass, which, of course, will uh, be something that we encourage moving forward. Right. And what happens is any time there is a cogen uh, and or biomass generation, uh, we now have a discussion on how that power is evacuated to the national grid. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. All right, and of course we'll uh, briefly just get uh, some clarification also from uh, the power sector as far as the draft uh, regulatory bill, uh, the nuclear, nuclear draft regulatory bill is concerned and how also you maybe uh, are playing into this, are you, have you added any uh, you know, sort of uh, provisions to this particular bill that you think will be very pivotal when it comes to also your sector as well. But I want to talk about now, because of our interest of time and we have a lot to cover, uh, the tax policy uh, implementation in this country, because this has been adversely affecting. Because I'm given to understand up to now, the key issue hampering the manufacturing sector has to do with tax policy uh, impl implementation in this country. VAT refunds from KRA take too long. Uh, to come through and which uh, constraints activities uh, within the manufacturing sector. I'm given to understand up to now, uh, the pre-2013 VAT refunds have not been made or have they? Maybe you can tell us. I, I wish, maybe from uh, the player herself. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been talking a lot about tax lately. A lot. <laughs> so I seem to be spending my life with the KRA. Um, I, I think uh, there, there are several elements of taxation uh, that, that need to be resolved. 
So I think we mentioned this a little earlier. First of all, it's, it's more about the predictability of the taxation environment. Yes. So understanding exactly what the KRA is expecting from you over the next, not just 12 months, mm -hmm. but three, four, five years so that you could start to plan as a business uh, how you're going to evolve within the Kenyan context. Um, we personally have had excise shocks that have come completely left of field uh, end of 2015 was the largest that we we had and we're still we're still reeling from that actually as an industry um, and more recently we've uh, had uh, increases in the cost of tax stamps and you've seen that's been in the news quite a lot uh, this week so we had an 87 percent increase in the cost of tax stamps to the tobacco industry and this is an administrative cost it's not a revenue generating stream, mm -hmm. uh, supposedly, mm -hmm. uh, and this came without any dialogue uh, with the industry uh, at all. So it's now the largest part of our wrapping material cost. So the largest part of the cost of the cigarette, apart from the tobacco, is the tax stamp. So And there's, there's, there's little benefit to us. From a VAT perspective, we work extremely closely uh, with, with the authorities to try to improve the, the process, but it's not streamlined. Uh, I would say. All right. Yeah. So, so, what are the hiccups right now? Uh, we can hear from maybe from uh, Flora to tell us uh, what are, what is the challenge with uh, you know tax reforms implementation? Is the government giving you a headache? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, um, basically, what we do need is to have a pro-industry um, policy regime. Like she says, stability and predictability is actually what is the biggest killer. Because the government could wake up today and say, excise, excise, you know, like she says, the excise. Um, we had it. We had it on our beverage sector where they said we're putting in excise, e um, excise stamps on your beverage lines. Cut your line right, right about here. Put in this machine to do the calculation. Fine, it is a good idea. The government does need revenue, and you know, as manufacturers, we're willing to pay the revenue. But the way it is done. So the predictability and then the, pri uh, the, the, the consultation also needs to be a bit more. So if they were to tell us within 18 months, this mm -hmm. is what we want to do, and this is, this is how we see it. Remember, we're, we're the commercialization, yes. we're the commercial arm. So we would come and say, this is actually not conducive. Our machines come from Germany and where else and where else. And it's not very easy to just cut the machine and put in, put in a stamp like that. So what I would say about, about the, the it, we need a, a predictable environment mm -hmm. and we need, uh, we need to have some consultation with government as they're want, wanting to raise this, the, this, um, the tax. I'll give you another example. Um, we have an export, what I would call now a disincentive. Mm -hmm. There's an export formula where they calculate ar around VAT, um, how, how, how to calculate your VAT based on the refund, that is actually becoming a disincentive. So mm -hmm. I had one of my manufacturers saying that he used to export 30% of his book. Yes. Now it's cheaper for, he's done the figures and he needs to export, he can only export 12% of his book. Otherwise he's, he's always in a, in a refund um, basis. Sure. We've had several um, um, discussions with KRA on this. Yes. And they, this also the solving of issues takes quite a long, a long time. If we looked at it like partners on the same, on the, well, I'm not sure we'd ever be on the same side with the taxman, but if we looked at it as, you know, this is, this is a necessary evil that has to be addressed, and we did come out and say, um, within so many months, prepare yourself, this is what we want, I believe they'll get good input, and it is possible that they would also raise their, their revenue. Mm -hmm. If as for, sorry, sorry, recently they came in, I think it was about last year, they came in with what they're calling a withholding tax. Withholding so tax. Every, every player is supposed to withhold 6% of, of, of um, their VAT. And it was a way for the, for the Kenya revenue to actually increase their, their collection of, of um, tax. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they have, but it has been a pain. The way, the, the way it works has been a pain. It's an ad administrative expense. Um, the manufacturer, oh, actually, every, nobody got actually any compensation for it. And it is affecting us because if, like for example, one of your manufacturers does not um, remit the tax, you cannot claim the tax. So now we are we are actually holding much more in our in, in our working capital, mm -hmm. not only the you know you know the VAT which is refundable, yes. um, but but also the this um, withholding tax. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the pain areas that we need to be able to sit down work out together in, if, if we're going to help KRA and help the manufacturer actually get to the 15% of the GDP. Mm -hmm. uh, and is the corporate tax uh, uh, friendly to you as well? Corporate tax? Um, well, I mean, the, the corporate tax structures are, are pretty straightforward, to be honest. It's, it's the, the simplest part, <coughs> I would say, uh, of the whole equation. Um, I, I think I would just sort of reiterate that um, the, the KRA's revenues have gone down. So from the tobacco industry, 
uh, we remitted 18 billion shillings uh, in 2017. It was down 1.2 billion shillings versus 2016. And that's the knock-on effect of excise shocks. So the instability of the industry has meant that, you know, the remittances actually to the KRA have gone down, not up. So interestingly, because that's happened in 2017, we're now having a lot more dialogue with the KRA. So they're very interested to talk to us about our thoughts about the future taxation process, which is fantastic. But it's just a shame that it was the reduction in the remittances that triggered uh, these discussions. Right. Okay, uh, let's hear from Professor and if you will have to weigh in uh, on the tax reforms and uh, also from uh, uh, Baraza, if it's, that is not really out right up your alley, we shall move also to other topics as well. Bri very briefly from uh, Professor. The government gets more tax if the turnover increases. So what they should concentrate on is, because every time there is a transaction, they get 16% VAT. Mm -hmm. So the more transactions there are, the more revenue they get. However, if they put in any measures which reduce those transactions, even if they make the tax 100%, they will not get more revenue. Mm -hmm. So what they need to do is basically concentrate on how can they increase that turnover. Mm -hmm. Right. Baraza. Well, um, one thing I can say is um, there are many green, uh, green areas where KRA uh, needs to improve on the tax administration. And one of the areas, of course, which I know um, the CS National Treasurer has been looking at is how do you um, bring on board taxation of the informal sector? Um, of course, there's a lot uh, out there um, uh, where there's a lot of um, income generating activities that are not in the tax brackets. Yes. So um, for me, it's a challenge to uh, carry to just uh, think outside the box on how they can uh, net uh, some of those uh, tax potential payers in the informal sector. But by and large, there's a lot of potential in Kenya uh, to increase the tax revenues by just improving the administration part of it. I know iTax is doing a lot, um, basically to improve the administration, but the biggest challenge is to increase uh, the taxpayers, especially for the informal sector. For the informal sector. And of yes. course, the biggest debate has been on that sector. <laughs> yeah, has yeah. Been, do you formalize the <laughs> informal sector? <laughs> it will not be a Juakali anymore yeah. to formalize it. And if you do, then how are you going to in incentivize this uh, you know, sector as well? That has also been a big, big debate. But the jewelry sector is a big sector that needs actually, when we're talking about KRA also, trying to, you know, uh, get some revenue streams so that maybe they can up the ante in terms of revenue collection. The jewelry sector is a big sector. And, and people are still grappling with uh, the jewelry, sec uh, jewelry sector. What do we do with the jewelry, jewelry sector? I think very briefly you can comment on that, then we move to, to labor. I think also labor has been uh, something because we're really stuck for time, but we need to rush, rush on this because we want to also to drill deeper on the labor skills. Very briefly, jewelry sector? Well, jewelry sector, if you look at um, the number of people who pay tax, is actually only 2.5 million. And the actual, I think, um, employment is, is something to the tune of about 15 point something million. Mm. So you can see definitely there's a lot of people who earn income that are, are not roped in, which is the informal sector. How would you rope them in? Um, you'd probably have to make is, is formalization. I'll give you an example. For us, we're based in um, any formal employ, um, location. Mm -hmm. We have from the NSSF to NHIF, you know, the regulator coming in regularly to make sure that you're, 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 you're doing the right thing. Sometimes you can have up to, within a quarter, you can have three or four from a similar organization. Now, if you, if you made it simple for the, for the informal sector to formalize, you know, to register, once you're registered with an NSSF, it becomes simple like VAT, how it's a turnover tax, I believe you'd, you'd, you'd be able to rope them in and you'd be, you'd be able to actually to attract them. Finally, I think um, pension. The other day we were talking to the NSSF looking for long-term yes. funds for manufacturers. And um, we were asking them, perhaps you could do like a revolving fund where these people come to borrow from there and in that, you know, force them to save. And that would help you actually rope them in and um, be able to start formalizing them. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, do you grapple yeah. with the Jokali sector? I know yes, you've been I, in Kenya now, you know what Jokali <laughs> sector is. Yeah, I've worked in Nigeria. There's a very similar ah, okay. um, system there as well. Um, yes, I do know about it. We have about 80,000 people that would probably fall into that category working directly 
uh, with BAT. So from if I get past the distributors and the wholesalers where they would be, be being looked at by the relevant authorities, once you get to the retail, it's completely out of their control. But I think it's a combination of the things that Flora just mentioned about simplicity, uh, but also about how do we facilitate these people to access capital and grow their businesses. Because as long as they stay very small and fragmented, the thought of actually having to pay taxes just becomes an additional burden uh, to them and the way that they, they go about their business. So it has to happen in both directions. We have to facilitate yeah. them to develop their businesses with uh, better policies and the way that we manage SMEs in, in um, in Kenya uh, and then secondly make the ease of the taxation process much sig significantly mm -hmm. different for that for that informal sector right yeah. talking about uh, formalization and we don't now we can actually peg in the 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 aspect of labor skills because I'm, I'm given to understand that the manufacturing sector as well uh, like many sectors is grappling with the issue of qualified uh, workers uh, as well uh, they, there are so many of them good, you know, hands-on, but when it comes to paperwork, accreditation, that is a different kettle of fish altogether. And the question has been, how then do you, where do you place this particular gentleman who is so qualified in terms of executing the duties, making the, 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 the proper machinery, but you don't have the, the, the requisite, uh, the requisite uh, uh, papers, right? Because uh, the, 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 the manufacturing sector says uh, it has identified issues uh, with skills in its labor force, which there's a clear gap between education and skills. You from the academia, you can tell us more uh, about this it's structural issues that not many Kenyans are, tr are training to work in the manufacturing sectors because uh, the sector is not seen as to be as vibrant as the services sector, like you know, uh, an accountant or uh, you know, IT. Very briefly, Professor. The private sector takes a cue from the government because the government is the one that has salary uh, structures, and I think Parliament has put together. Now, if you look at that uh, salary structure, it doesn't address skills. They want this degree, they want uh, this qualification. Now, if you shifted uh, that, uh, you can say, uh, maybe try and have a look at S what SRC has proposed. Where is the, the artisan? Where is the, mm -hmm. the theatre uh, actor? Yes. They are low, well below there, uh, while the person with a PhD or a, a master's or whichever degree is the one whose salary is up. Now, if you change that so mm. that the, that person with the skills, the, the bus driver who is skilled, who can guarantee he will not cause an accident, mm -hmm. is up there, and uh, maybe the, the, the other person, maybe the teacher or the, the doctor, unless he has those skills, then he's down there. The doctor will become a bus driver. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it is all about where is, the, where is the private sector or government putting the bread. Now, once, once that has been done, the private sector then uh, looks at all these people and says, who can do my work at the lowest pay. Mm -hmm. So if you want people to have skills, then the salary structure and remuneration should be such that skills are enumerated. Right now, we remunerate knowledge, and knowledge basically is uh, academic. Mm -hmm. Right, academic. Uh, maybe you can come to Baraza. Uh, someone is asking, this is Mover Israel. Please ask Fernandez Baraza about employment at, in Ketraco. Yeah, Kenyan technicians are suffering a lot. Or is it because of corruption? Yep. It corruption? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so on talking on labor skills, maybe you can weigh in on that very briefly. Now, one, one of the things we are trying to do um, definitely is to also uh, appreciate that you don't just need engineers um, to deliver on your mandate. You also have some role for technicians. Uh, we have largely um, been improving our operational maintenance departments where we are now recruiting um, substation technicians mm -hmm. and the craftsmen because we need uh, those diploma certificate holders in, ele in electricals yes. and power mechanics. So one thing I can assure uh, that Kenyan is, um, Ketraku is uh, largely employing uh, technicians. We're also even going further uh, to employ um, technicians 
the so-called clock of wax uh, on the sites for construction. So it is not that Ketrak is only dealing with um, engineers, um, degree holders, but we also uh, largely uh, bring on board technicians because we appreciate uh, the value of technicians in our substations and also in terms of the day-to-day -day supervision of the construction works through the COWs. Mm -hmm. yeah, so that is ongoing. That is ongoing. Absolutely. All right, briefly, uh, as also we are preparing to wind up and then we ask some uh, also critical questions as well. But the question will be, uh, is there a, a crisis? Because also the employers are actually uh, saying, we, 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 we can see there is such a disconnect between the degrees and uh, the experience of the ground, the skill set is diametrically different. Maybe we have been actually very th uh, theory oriented in terms of teaching in our universities. Mm -hmm. And a person who's coming from a technical college mm -hmm. is far way better than an actually university graduate. Mm -hmm. So employers are saying, what is happening with our system? Mm -hmm. You as an association, what are the people and the stakeholders really saying on the ground? Is it true that there is actually a disconnect between uh, theory, where we have a system where we engagitate and then regurgitate what you've been taught. Once you actually get your papers, you're done with school, but when you get the hammer, or maybe you get the spanner, it's a different kettle of fish altogether. That is absolutely correct. We are finding there's a huge gap between academia and industry. When we, we look at, um, let's say, the technical colleges, let's be, let's, let's be honest, there was a collapse of technical colleges. A lot of them started escalating towards um, university degrees, so we didn't have a lot of technicians. So mm. nobody was training these people. So if uh, my manufacturers were looking for, for technicians, I go and poach from, from my competitors and everybody else, which is not <coughs> a conducive environment. So what we've done, we've, we've um, now linked, tried to link academia and industry, yes. where we have a program running currently with the GIZ, where we are actually taking students out of the, the technical colleges into industry, more importantly, within, we're following them every month, having interviews and finding out how did industry find those, te those technical whatever and taking that information back to augment um, yes. the, 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 the syllabus of um, industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, sorry, of the academia. Mm -hmm. the, other, the other issue, of course, um, let's face it, a lot of industries have a lot more um, better equipped um, labs and environments yes. that you're not going to get in, in the colleges in the technical colleges and the universities. So you are finding, you know, megatronics. It's, you can only learn it on the shop floor because you learn it, you can only learn it in the textbook and come to the shop floor. So again, there's that gap. So we are working closely with the ministry, we're working closely with our, 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 you know, anybody that we can to actually see how, again, we bridge that gap. Because it's got to be a practicality. I think we're going to push a lot more for having what you call sandwich courses, where you've got to stop, stop the education, go, go do some training and go back to school. So they're, they're, it's a two-pronged approach where mm -hmm. we're doing it at the technical. Again, we're trying to just link the gap between academia and university. Yes, but and it of is course, a, it is a big, it is a big problem. It is a big uh, problem. Yes. So, uh, it, is there any prime solution? Because we, this will be also uh, costly to you, the manufacturer, because you have all these fresh graduates that come to your farm, and then you have to bear another cost of trying, you know, to streamline them within that particular sector that you do have. We know right now uh, we have electronic uh, uh, cigarettes. I don't know if now you are actually manufacturing this, the, the electronic cigarettes or, you know, that is diametrically different. Do you need specialized engineers as well when you're coming to, you know, ele electronic cig cigarettes? This is in light also of uh, a sustainability approach that you, you're taking. Very briefly. Yeah. Um, I agree with everything that's been said. So, yes, yes, we, we do have a skill gap and we do spend a lot of money as an organization uh, developing people that we bring into the business that we see would have the potential to to fill the, the, the correct roles. So we do a lot of things. We have internships in, in BAT and we do this globally. We have what we call a global graduate program, which is almost like doing an MBA mm. within uh, BAT. So we do spend a lot of money to get people to the right level of experience and expertise. But why do we do that? We do that because we then move people around countries to give them different experiences so that it's not just Kenya specific. They can go out, learn different things, come back to their home business and add significant value. So that's one of the reasons why we would definitely continue to invest in this space. But I would certainly encourage uh, Kenya to have a look at the skill gap at the technical level. It's, it's an area of concern. 
from a capability change point of view, mm -hmm. uh, it's something that we have to do as a business in terms of evolution. So yes. we're constantly looking at what would the new skill sets be that would be required for the next 5, 10, 15 years to drive uh, sustainability of your workforce uh, and the talent that you have within your business. Uh, we, we do do e-cigarettes and tobacco heating products. Mm -hmm. We call them our next generation products. Yes. Uh, they're not yet available uh, in Kenya. They're not yet available. Uh, not yet available in Kenya. Is that Kenya. the VEP? We're talking about the VEP? Uh, vaping, yes. The vaping, our product yeah. is called Vipe. Yes. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> yes, our, viping pro our vaping product is called Vipe uh, and we have a tobacco heating product, both of which products we think are, are very uh, useful to bring to markets because they have a harm reduction impact, plus it's giving a lot more choice uh, to consumers uh, who enjoy uh, nicotine. So, uh, so it's an it's an evolutionary it's process. A, thank you. Yeah. And of course, this is where Prof will actually now get maybe a good chance to actually get that particular contract he was looking for with you earlier. You remember? <laughs> 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 because now you have the next generation products, and of course, uh, also skill set will be very pivotal uh, when it comes to coming up with this next generation product uh, from uh, BAT. Would you just tell, should we also raise accusatory fingers to the academia? Because right now you are transforming the universities, the technical actually college and uh, yeah, tertiary colleges to universities. So we don't have skill sets when we want plumbers, carpenters, we actually, you know, uh, frustrated. All that, has that. To, that, all that has to be to do with the legislative, you can say policy and regulatory environment because that is where you attack the change. The good thing about uh, legislation or policy or regulatory, it costs the government almost nothing. Because all these people who would make uh, legislation or policy or reg uh, regulations are in place. Okay. Now, once you do that, the other people must fall in line. Yes. Okay. So, uh, uh, let's look at uh, the skill sets that you are you are talking about. Where should it start? Right now, people are concentrating at the universities or the tech. By the time a person is going to the university, he's an adult. He's almost too old to change. So if you want somebody to be an engineer mm -hmm. or a technician, it must be either at primary school level yes. or at secondary school, because that's where you shape their thinking and their orientation. Now, there are certain subjects that do that. And in fact, almost all the subjects that train uh, train people, mm -hmm. they are the cheapest to teach. Mm -hmm. Maths, you only need a blackboard and chalk. Uh, right now, there is nowhere in Kenya where you teach engineering drawings. Engineering drawings is cheap. You need uh, a pencil, a rubber, and a geometric set. And all those things are normally uh, compulsory. Mm -hmm. But we don't teach engineering drawing anywhere in our school. In fact, Technical one of the reasons why our engineers cannot, uh, cannot design and fabricate and manufacture, they cannot draw. And if you ask any student at any of our universities, the subject he hates most, they look forward to when it will end. Thank is engineering drawing. But now, an engineer who cannot draw is not an engineer. Now, the way to introduce but, it but we should fall is that you, you, we secondary you, school. We have the research fund that we give you to actually do this research, actually. How actually we can try and improve the, you know, this sort of uh, skill gaps that we have when it comes to you know, drawing. It is policy. When you are saying, for example, uh, let's introduce mother tongue yes. at primary school, that same breath could say, let's introduce engineering drawing at secondary school. Then you'll have a very large pool of people from whom you can train either as technicians. But if you wait until they have graduated, I can tell you it's too late. So then again, mother tongue, it will be translating <laughs> the whole curricula again, you know, to your mother tongue. And some of the even isotopes, maybe I don't know if you have it, in the mother tongue, if you want to, do, you know, go the nuclear way as well, how will you even translate when it? We, when we, we went to school, the first three years, you, lo you learnt mother tongue. <laughs> and that is Let, how let's basically... Leave, let's leave it at that. <laughs> let's leave it at that. <laughs> we are start for time, but I'll release if we just close this without also Fernandez are telling us, because you promised Kenyans that uh, in 2018, that negotiated a temporary reprieve 
from uh, Isoflux. You remember? that uh, it will come into effect and of course we were embroiled or your company was embroiled in some uh, you know uh, uh, some uh, not really uh, 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 some gray areas that we didn't understand of uh, the negligence in award of a major contract to Spanish uh, firm Isolux Isolux and uh, you you promised Isolux Ingenieria which is a Spanish firm so you promised by next month actually we'll have uh, you know the Longayani Suso power line you know uh, evacuating power from there because you're frustrated uh, because the circumstances were beyond your control uh, given that yes on paper this particular farm looked very well but uh, on the ground as well uh, from some few months later uh, the, the, the company tanked went down the tubes and so you're frustrated by that tell us what about this and how are Kenyans bearing you know uh, the burden of pay, paying this particular uh, tax uh, I think penalty that came from that, or for, was it a contractual penalty? Very briefly, we are winding up. Yeah. My director, Mark, is on my case. Yeah, just to um, be very brief, we definitely um, were hoping to have completed the line by end of uh, April, yes. but definitely because of the unforeseen circumstances uh, where uh, the contractor then, uh, as looks, um, went bankrupt, uh, we had to take a very quick uh, action by terminating that contract. Uh, which we did uh, last year. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we quickly um, moved in speed to get uh, somebody who has the financial and technical capacity to deliver the line. So at the moment, we already have a consortium uh, of a Chinese firm mm -hmm. uh, backed by the state grid uh, who already are mobilized. And we are hoping that uh, this will definitely be now delivered by um, end of August. What we have done is to have uh, a discussion with the uh, Electricana, <coughs> uh, where the DGE payments have been deferred, of course, uh, with a consideration we paid last year. Mm -hmm. So one thing I can assure Kenyans is we're not paying DG right now. We deferred the DG until uh, August, which is when the line will be delivered. And we are very hopeful. In fact, we do now weekly mm -hmm. uh, reviews. In fact, this week, uh, my CS will be traveling uh, okay. either tomorrow I was there last week. We have a team, we have interministerial committee mm -hmm. uh, where all the efforts by government are now being focused. The national treasurer has delivered all the money and I'm confident that this line now will be delivered by end of August. Thank you. Thank yes. you very much. Let's leave it at that and thank you for that clarification. Of course, so, uh, Kenyans have a clear view of that as, as well. Now they were expecting and of course uh, uh, you've uh, given a wider perspective on what is really happening on the ground. I want to thank you so much because I can see my time is out and my director is on my case chasing me away telling me go and take breakfast with your panelists right now. It's time to go take yeah. breakfast uh, in the boardroom. Thank you very much. I want to thank you uh, so much Flora Mutai, the chair of Kenya Association uh, of Manufacturers. Also uh, Beverly Spencer of Batayimbo uh, who is uh, the managing director of British American Tobacco Kenya. Thank you very much for coming through. Fernandez Barraza, the managing director at Ketraco, uh, thank you for coming uh, through as well this morning to tell us more of the energy sector and how also that is really uh, hanging or in tandem with uh, the you know, cost of uh, manufacturing. And of course, Professor Francis Muller from the University of Nairobi Department of Biochemistry, thank you for coming through. We've not exhausted in many ways right what we had we not even look at the global dynamics access to ma markets east african integration there's a lot i think you should come back right well, we continue the, the discussion a there's a leadership forum <laughs> over there <laughs> i know the leadership forum yeah, is on monday yeah. of course this discussion has acted as a segue to the leadership forum that will be happening yeah. at the university of nairobi yes. i want to thank you so much and also thank you to my director mark for being gracious enough to extend some more time for us as well thank you also for your valid company a lot of reactions as well on uh, social media as well uh, can see rush of tweets. I uh, cannot be able to read all of them right now. And I thank you also for your valid company. Have a lovely day.